Gabriele Mondello from the University of uh, Roma Sapienza, and uh, he, will be, he will be talking about uh, spherical metrics uh, with conical singularities. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. So um, I will use mostly the blackboard and just uh, a little bit uh, the projector for some pictures. So I would like first to motivate uh, why one would like to look at uh, uh, spherical metrics on surfaces uh, with conical singularities. So uh, first of all, let me say that the work is joined with Dmitry Panov at King's College of London. So uh, let me remind some motivation. So in the, for closed surfaces, uh, there is a uh, a famous theorem by Kebe and Poincaré. This is that if we have S, a compact connected orientable surface with, with genus at least two, then for every conformal class, there is exactly one remarkable metric, which is one metric with constant curvature. And because of the gauss bonnet constraint, this must be a curvature or negative curvature. So in every conformal class, there exists a unique metric, H, such that the curvature of h is minus one. Okay, so why, uh, well, using this result, one basically obtains a, a correspondence between a conformal structure, say complex, let's use the orientation, so complex structures on S and uh, hyperbolic, so matrix on S. And clearly this correspondence can, we can view this correspondence up to isotopy on S. And that's uh, what we have <clears throat> on the left is uh, what is called Teichmuller space of S. So, well, we all know the importance of this result is that on, on a space of conformal structure, we can work using this special metric, which is completely canonical. And so we have all the constructions that, that we know. So one, of course, can also do something in genus one. So if you have a torus with flat metrics, so clearly the correspondence works also in genus one using flat metric, which is essentially unique up to, up to rescaling. So, okay, so one, of course, one could try to, to say something about uh, matrix of curvature one, which is what they call spherical, but there is very little to say because if you look for compact surface, compact surface is basically you only have the sphere. So, there is not much interest in that. But we know that in many contexts, what is useful is to consider surfaces with marked points or removing the marked points, surfaces with punctures. So if we consider surfaces with punctures, so this is the puncture surface as minus P, where P is a collection of n point, distinct points, then, of course, when you, when you look for some canonical metric, then, uh, of course, there is the problem of prescribing what kind of behavior you want at the, at the conical point, at, the, at these missing points, at these punctures. So suppose that, uh, so some 
kind of, you can ask, for example, that these are boundary components, which are totally geodesic, or in the hyperbolic setting, you can ask that this is a cusp, but you can also ask that this looks like a, a cone point. So we can assign some numbers, one number at each conical point, and we can want to look for metric of constant curvature and uh, conical singularity of angle 2 pi theta i. I put just, just this 2 pi for practical reasons at the point pi. Now, what are conical singularities? Well, we all imagine what they are, especially in the flat case. So this means that uh, near pi, if we take uh, um, uh, polar coordinates, then the metric should be uh, writable uh, as uh, R square, uh, so polar coordinates say R phi, D phi square, and here we have theta I square. This is the case where it's flat, and uh, uh, in the hyperbolic we have the square of the hyperbolic sign, and in the spherical case, we have sine of R. Let me just stick to these three cases. Okay, so what happens? Uh, uh, so what's what's the analogous of Kerber Poincaré result? This was proven by in uh, 99 uh, by, well, 99, 91, McCowan and Trojanov, um, of course, in order to have uh, the assigned singularities, uh, uh, there is a constraint, like here we had the genus at least two. Here there is a constraint on the Euler characteristic and the uh, and, uh, amplitude of the angles. So uh, if we take theta 1, theta m, such that um, 2 minus uh, 2g plus uh, sum of theta i minus 1 uh, less than 0, then in every conformal class, so the same statement holds, conformal class, there exists a unique metric with k equal to minus 1 and let me just write angles theta. So singularities, conical singularities of angles theta at, at uh, p. Okay, so the same result also holds uh, for uh, flats. So if this is equal to zero, then the same result. So also k equal to zero for two minus two g plus sum of theta j minus one equal to zero. Okay, so what is, uh, so one can then wonder what happens in the case k greater than one. Uh, sorry, greater than zero. So what about k equal one? <clears throat> okay, so uh, let me call this quantity just for practical reason. Delta j, let me call it theta j minus 1 is called uh, defect. 
So in fact, it's zero exactly when the point is smooth. So the angle is exactly uh, two pi, and then it can be negative or positive. So when it's, this is, uh, this basically represents a curvature, a delta of the curvature minus delta j. So if delta is positive, there is some point of negative, of negative uh, curvature concentrated there. Okay, so um, in order to state what are the problems that, uh, so I would like first to make a list of problems about spherical matrix and then say what are the few things that with Panoff up to now we have treated. So, uh, okay, so let's pick just as a notation, just a, a base point. Okay, so there are three spaces, uh, three sets for the moment that we want to look at. So the first set is uh, sp theta, which is uh, uh, the set of matrix H on S, S dot, with curvature one and angles theta, sorry, two pi, theta j at pj. This still up to isotopy. And then there are two maps. One is, let me call it f theta. This goes to Taikmula space. This is a Taikmula space of S where we look at the conformal structures up to isotopies but that fix the, the points p. So what is this map? This is basically every metric defines a J, so a quasi-complex structure. So you attach the quasi-complex structure and over the points, singularities, conical singularities define a conformal structure that extends over the point. So this defines really a complex structure on the whole S. And the other map, let me call all theta, is the map to the monodromy map to the representation variety with values in SO3R. So let me say what this is because we will need and then we will discuss some of the problems that are motivated also for what happens in negative curvature. So once we have this S, so if we have S dot, we fix a universal cover. We pick also here a base point and we pick a pre-image. And then every time we assign a metric H here, we can pull back the metric to an H tilde here. Now matrix, so this is curvature of H, so is one. So if you have something of curvature one, locally, it's an older result. This is isometric to a portion of sphere. So it means that locally you have a map to S2. And then all these local maps can be glued, but they define a globally well-defined unique map if the surface is simply connected. If it's not simply connected, then when you're back, you might not glue. But if it's simply connected, this defines a developing map. So this is the standard sphere with the standard metric. Okay, so dev, the developing map is, dev is a local isometry. And it is also equivariant with respect to a representation row from the fundamental group of S to the group of isometries of S3. So basically, this gives us the output is two data, row and dev. And really, once you start sending the first patch, this can be done pretty arbitrarily in the sense that when you start doing the first patch, then 
you, you can translate the first one using elements of SO3. So really, this couple is not uniquely defined, but this is uniquely defined up to action of a global action of SO3. So here, this is, you can compose dev with an element G of the group, and you can conjugate So basically, you can get this couple or this couple, depending on how you take the first, the first development map. So basically, what you get is not, so is not exactly an element in the homomorphism, space of homomorphism inside SO3, but in the space of homomorphism up to action, this action by conjugation. So really, what is well-defined is an element this, which is HOM mod, this HOM mod SO3. Okay, so this is the holonomy, this holonomy. So it sends H to the class of rho of H, of its uh, monodromy. Okay, so um, I described these two maps because uh, now I can formulate questions uh, and the problems uh, also in terms of this. So, so let me start with the first type of problems. Is uh, we don't know when uh, this set of spherical matrix is empty or not. So there might. Uh, what I mean is that the genus and the angle theta might impose some constraint on the existence of, of even a single matrix on the surface. Clearly, we know that there must be some gauss bonnet constraint. But this might not be sufficient. We will see that in the case, it's not sufficient to guarantee that there exists a single metric here. And then, of course, one can also ask whether this is connected or what's the homotopy type and so on. So a second class of problem is a bit more geometric, is whether this is smooth. So What's the dimension of this space? And uh, also, if it carries some symplectic structure and some volume form, or some volume, actually. What's the volume of this space? Here is for theta, say, theta fixed. Then, uh, looking at the map, uh, if I want to analyze this map whole, then I might wonder whether this rep is smooth. And again, what's the dimension? And if the map F, the map, sorry, the map hall is a local diffeo. Now I'm listed this problem, these problems, because uh, indeed uh, here in the hyperbolic case, uh, or even in the flat case, we know that this is uh, non-empty as soon as the gauss bonnet constraint gives. And in fact, that's, uh, that's really exactly in bijection with Eichmuller space of what we said. And so we know it's also connected, we know the homotopy type. Also we know it's smooth, the dimension, we know a lot of things, and also we know something, not, true, not everything, about the representation variety. And we know something else about the holonomy. And uh, uh, also, what is the image of Hall? There is another classical problem. What kind of monodromy representations arise as monodromies of the, some structure, for example, in this case of spherical matrix? 
And now let me end the list, and then we can discuss what we proved. So the kind of naive question D is uh, how many metrics are there in each conformal class so this is one for flat or hyperbolic but it's not true in general for for a spherical and in fact this is the same as analyzing the uh, the map f so if f is surjective, then this means that there is at least one metric in each conformal class. Asking that f is finite, or with finite fibers actually, so that there are finitely many metrics in each class, or one could also wonder if f is proper, or if it branches, and where it branches. And, uh, okay, so we are close to the end. E is, uh, is there a complex structure on this S? This is, uh, I mean, the, in the hyperbolic case, this is, uh, one can use the bijection with Eichmuller space and say, okay, yes, there is a complex structure, here it is. But, here, it's, it's not clear exactly because it's not a bijection, so... I mean. And uh, last one is uh, how the, the generations of spherical metrics look like. Which is somehow, in some senses, studying uh, what is a good boundary for this space. Okay, let me see. I would like to just discuss some of these problems. So like this one, which is, seems the easiest. And then also smoothness and, and dimension of the representation variety and of the space of spherical metrics, and also the fact that when is the monodromy a local, uh, a local diffure. And uh, here, we cannot treat most of the questions except for this. And the, the upshot is that in the end, we will, we will discover that these two spaces are both uh, except somewhere I will discuss, are both smooth of the same dimension, and this map is proper. And actually, one can also orient the space so that indeed there is a degree. So in each connected component, once we chop off some walls, there is a degree, and this is uh, in the number of expected metrics in each uh, conformal class, which, seems, which says that um, counted with a suitable multiplicity on the general fiber, there is a, a fixed number of metrics no matter what conformal class we take and no matter how we move the angles, provided the angles remain in, the, in a fixed chamber. So the space of angles is chopped off by some hyperplanes and then uh, we have some kind of uh, number in each, uh, in, each, uh, in each class. Probably there is also some kind of, one can study what happens when you cross the walls, but we haven't done this. Okay, so uh, let me say something about the first problem, which is, uh, seems uh, uh, not particularly maybe interesting, but actually most of the solution arrived a few years ago. Ah, by the way, so let me first, let's use this uh, projector and show what what we know in the case of uh, lower genus. So there are some cases which seems very simple, but still, so case of genus zero with n equal one point. Then in this case, uh, there is not much to say. This is just the round sphere. And the angle must be exactly two pi. 
already when we have n equal to 2, there are two examples that we show now in the picture. And this was worked out by Turyanov. And for n equal to 3, this is even less elementary and was were classified by Yermenko. And uh, in this case, there, are exactly, there is exactly one metric in each conformal class. So now I'll show you how they look like. They're not very difficult to understand, so. Um, uh, okay, so the case is in genus two, sorry, in, uh, with two points in genus zero, there are these cases. So this is just, uh, you take portion between two meridians and then you glue the two meridians. So you have a surface with two conical points, same angle, and they are pi apart one from the other. And this you can have for any angle. Or there is this special case. So you have two angles which have angle multiple of two pi. And uh, the distance between the two points uh, can be arbitrary. So basically you produce this just taking the sphere, taking two, any two points, and then taking a cyclic cover of order uh, or integral order or order k. There is a double cover. So here you have angle uh, four pi at these two points. So these are the only two cases uh, in genus zero with two conical points. The, um, in genus zero with three conical points, uh, this is uh, equivalent uh, to classifying triangles. And actually classifying triangles, uh, well, one can think that you have basically maybe this and uh, maybe this, but uh, there are many more other triangles that you cannot embed in the sphere. So uh, there is uh, oh, this is quadrilaterals. So there is uh, indeed a constraint. Sorry. So for triangles, or which is equivalent is three punctured spheres, there is already some constraint. We will see now. So. I said uh, most uh, of the result of non-emptiness uh, came in 2011 by three analysts, uh, Bartolucci, uh, De Marquis, and Malchiodi, who showed that in uh, genus at least one, of course, uh, we take angles that theta that satisfy the gauss bonnet constraint. And then uh, they show that in each conformal class, uh, there exists at least one metric H with the assigned angles to pi theta, but indeed they gave, uh, well, and theta, they gave uh, exactly an estimate from below on this number. So they showed that n theta with this n, let me call it uh, m, maybe. This m is a function of g and theta, and actually it increases uh, as theta increases. So actually they gave examples where this goes really I mean, we have an estimate from below on the number of metric. But this leaves out the case uh, uh, g equal to zero. So I must say also that uh, both them and Trojanov also show that if the angles are all less than one, then there exists a unique metric always. So for small angles, we always know. And uh, on, uh, uh, okay, also them is, also their work implies this result. Okay, so the, what we did uh, with, uh, with uh, Panoff was uh, trying to, to fix the case of genus zero and see what are the possible constraint to the exist, constraints to the existence of a spherical metric in genus zero. This is, 
this is uh, last year. Sorry? Uh, here, no, no, no. Here is uh, energy. Well, that's, uh, well, if theta is smaller, yeah, it must be g equal to zero in this case, yeah. So it's, uh, it's really, yeah, this is, it is really, well, what it does is a bit, a bit more than this. So in the differential equation, you can allow some angles also to be a bit bigger than two pi, and most of them to be smaller. So there is a, a critical constant that, that tells you that, uh, that everything works when the angles are not too big. But certainly this works if the angles are all small than two pi. This, is, this happens in the sphere case. So this is some kind of case, uh, sort of trivial, when it's already done. But the problem is when you are in genus zero, but the angles are very big. This is what you don't know. Yeah. You must have a, well, yeah, you must have at least three because the other cases are already done. Okay, so the, what are the constraints in this case? So the constraints, certainly you must have, okay, that this angle are zero, then there is a Gauss-Bonnet constraint, which is uh, two minus two uh, G plus sum of delta. Let's uh, express in terms of delta. This must be positive, this goes bonnet. And then, <clears throat> this is not enough. There is a, a third condition, which is uh, the following, is that the distance, so let's take Rn with the L1 distance, and inside Rn, let's take this uh, set of points, uh, integral points with odd sum. So this is points M in Zn, such that M1 plus Mn is odd. So the, the third condition can be phrased in this weird way. So the, the L1 distance from the vector of defects delta to Z to the n, odd must be at least one. So let me, let me state uh, uh, more precisely what are the implications. So this is a necessary condition. We will see also why. And we proved also almost the converse. So what we proved is that if, there is, if S of SP theta is non-zero, non-empty, non then this condition must hold. We are in genus zero. And uh, the converse holds if we have strict inequality. So here, if we have the, the distance delta z than zero is strictly greater than zero, and of course, all the other conditions. So there is a, there is a slightly tiny bit of uh, uncertainty when this is exactly zero, and we will see now in uh, when I will motivate the proof uh, why this is uh, slightly uncertainty. So where does this uh, come from? So let me show also what this looks like, uh, so the domain of angles. So let's take A, the possible uh, deltas. Let me call this condition A, B, and C. This, uh, sorry, let me call C and B. And we put C only in genus zero. Because there is no constraint in the higher genus. So this is the set of uh, defects that satisfy A, B, and possibly C if we are in genus zero. These are, this is somehow the space of admissible angles. 
and the picture of this strange set is uh, okay so these are quadrilaterals we don't care okay so it's something like this so I, I took a and then I chopped just a unit cube so the here these are the integral points of z n of course okay this picture is just schematic so I drew something three-dimensional but actually in three dimensions it doesn't look this this way in three dimensions it's just a tetrahedron so this is just a symbolic picture of what happens in the higher dimension so in higher dimension this is uh, so the the chopped domain is this light brown. Then this dark brown, darker brown, are the boundary of this domain imposed by this condition. So you see this condition imposes that this delta is far from odd integral points. And this dark, this dark black, these are the odd integral points. So you must be far from this. This wall that is inside, we will see later what it is. Okay, so why, so let me just give the idea of why this, or why, say, this implication holds. So clearly I have to motivate just this. So the fact is that if we have, uh, so the obstruction lies in the monodromy. In the sense that the problem is not uh, exactly creating H, but it's, if we have an H, then the monodrome, in order to exist, must satisfy something like this. Why? Because if we have H, then we have seen that we produce a representation inside SO3. Now, we can lift this representation. This is also classical in uh, closed surfaces that uh, we can leave this representation to SU2. So of course here, one can say, okay, that's not very surprising because that's uh, a free group here because we have punctures, so you can always leave the representation to SU2. But indeed, we want to lift the representation that behaves in a prescribed way. So the proposition is the following. So that if we have H, spherical matrix with angles theta, which is the vector of angles, then the rho h lifts to some rho h hat in SU2 such that uh, at the take gamma j is the loop that winds simply around the point pj. So this has eigenvalues, the exponential plus or minus i pi delta j. So why this? So you see that when the point is smooth, delta is zero, so this must lift to the identity. When the angle is four pi, you want it to lift to minus the identity. When it's six pi, you want it to lift to the identity, and so on. So it's... Uh, um, this is a kind of standard lift that you want, basically. That uh, you want that the, the two pi is lift to the identity, and then that if you start increasing the angle, then the lift varies continuously. Now, here, actually, there is not just uh, one, but there are two to the 2G lifts, like in the closed case. But if we are in genus zero, actually, this means that it's canonical. So lifts to in two to the two G ways up to conjugation. So this means that in the case of genus zero, it's canonical. And now the, the obstruction is in the existence of this lift. So one can understand the obstruction very geometrically. So if we have a sphere, we have the base point, we have pj, and we have this, which is gamma j. And let's call uh, uh, cj, which is a row hat 
of gamma j, that's an element of SU2. And because we know that gamma 1, gamma n is the identity in the fundamental group, then we must have that C1, Cn is the identity in SU2. Now, this is the, the equation that gives us uh, troubles because suppose that, so identify SU2 with a sphere, just fixing a base point and uh, sending just g to g times v0. Okay, so now using these elements, uh, we, can, uh, we can describe on this S3 a broken polygon. So we have v0. Then uh, we apply So we want to define D1 just as C1 inverse V0. So this is a C1 inverse. And then taking VK to be CK inverse VK minus 1. Then in the end, Vn must be Cn inverse, C1 inverse, V0, and so it must be V0. So this polygon that lies somehow on the, on the sphere must, uh, must close. And uh, you can compute uh, very easily what are the lengths of these sides. And the lengths of these sides uh, Uh, yeah. So because we know exactly how we lift it, so the length of the side uh, from v k minus one to v k, if this is delta j, and this is l j, the length on the on the sphere is something like this. So here this is one, this is two, this is zero, this is pi. So is uh, actually this is the distance between the, the two points. So basically you see that this, uh, this function is delta j, this function is two minus delta j, this function is delta j minus two, this is four minus delta j and so on. Okay, so now from this it is exercise. You see that you must have exactly where is this. So I'm claiming that this is just an exercise starting from this and just show you an example. So why should this be true? So example. Suppose that we are in case of, okay, we are genus zero with three points. And suppose that we take uh, the three angles, which are pi, uh, pi and, uh, uh, sorry, let's take three pi, three pi, and uh, zero, the other side is, okay, four pi, four pi, four pi. This corresponds to delta, which is one, one, one. And so actually the distance is zero from Z and O from delta to zero. And in fact, if you go and try to draw this, uh, this, uh, this diagram, then every angle for pi corresponds to a multiplication by minus the identity. So if you multiply three times minus the identity, you don't get the identity. So basically, the picture on the sphere is, you start at V0, 
then you are sent to minus v0, this is v1, then you are sent again to v0, and this is v2, and then v3, you are on the other side. This doesn't close up. And of course, you can see that if you perturb a little bit this, then it's still difficult that you, that you are back exactly to v0. You need to perturb a lot to be able to be back to v0. You have to perturb at least by one in total. So that's why you need that this distance is at least one. Okay, that's, this is just an easy argument. So uh, let me discuss just two uh, other points. So the monodromy map. Okay, so first of all, one has to, to say what structure one wants to give this space. So, uh, because we said that attached to, to every metric, we can attach a representation and a developing map. So basically, we have attached what is called an S2 SO3 structure. On S dot, which is uh, somehow a particular case of a CP1 structure. Which is a kind of CP1 structure where the monodromy is in SO3 or actually in a conjugate of SO3. So basically, you can d define this as a subset of the space of. CP1 structures. So we take this, the space of CP1. Okay, so let's take first another thing. So let's take first CP1 structures on, on S dot. And then we want to impose something like the analogous of the angles at the, at the punctures. So such that, that the Schweiz and derivative is, uh, sorry, has residue. The Schweiz and derivative is a quadratic differential, so has quadratic residue at pi, which is minus theta i square half at pi with respect to the Poincare projective structure. So we put on the, on the surface the hyperbolic, the Poincaré hyperbolic metric with cusps that defines a projective structure. With respect to that, we take just the projective structure that have this quadratic residue. This is the analogous as asking a conical behavior of angle theta i at pi. So this is what we call projective structures with moderate singularities. And then, uh, so this is the, the boundary behavior. Then we have to ask that the monodromy is uh, in a conjugate of SO3. <coughs> so what we do, we look at the monodromy map. So here, this is a monodromy map, the same as in the case of spherical surfaces, but here is CP1 structure, so it has a monodromy map inside PSL2C. And here, we can map, we can find representations into conjugates of SO3. Actually, this SO3 is like PSU2, which is inside this. And we take just the pre-image, so projective structure that have monodromies here. So the definition of this is we uh, take monodromies in PSU2 intersected, well, in uh, P mod, they intersected, even though P mod S P theta. So that's uh, one way to define this space. And uh, <clears throat> so the, the results. Uh, uh, 
in 93 by Luo was that this space is smooth. So in 93, just analyzing the deformation theory of this space, uh, Luo showed that S of SP theta is smooth of dimension, real dimension, because it's a real, up to now, real manifold. Dimension S 6G minus 6 plus 2N if the angles are not integral. And so there, there is this, this, uh, this constraint, and also if uh, H, sorry, if rho, no, H, is not rho h, is not a billion. So if we take a point which corresponds to a metric, then uh, this is smooth at h, near h is, a many, is an orbifold, if, and, uh, if the, this is not integral and this is not a billion. This is just a little deformation theory. And the same holds for rep. Same statement when you have representations in SO3. Now, this is not true that this is uh, when the, the angles uh, theta. Take theta. These are rho such that the boundary holonomy is exactly the one of a rotation by angle theta, which means that the trace of rho gamma j must be twice the cosine of theta j pi. So the, this is not true in general, that this is smooth when these angles are not integral. There are two kinds of problems. So this problem is just because if this is uh, abelian, uh, so it's, uh, then uh, uh, there are a lot, say, actually coaxial. So if it lies in a, in a subgroup, one parameter subgroup, then when you take quotient by conjugation, you make a mess. So the, you want to exclude this case. This really, it's a kind of a technical problem. It depends on the fact that this uh, uh, representation variety in some sense, uh, why uh, as a problem? Because you, you would think that uh, this is almost very close to this. So when you deform a little the representation, you can follow with the developing map, uh, which is in fact what happens in general. But when the representation has an angle which is integral, the monodromy at the, at the point uh, does not see the axis of a rotation. So a rotation of any angle determines an axis on the sphere, except when the rotation is multiple of 2 pi. In that case, it doesn't determine an axis. It doesn't tell you, well, the axis, the, po the marked points of the conical point is moving on the sphere. So this means that here you have more information somehow than here. And in fact, uh, what we do is uh, constructing a suitable uh, resolution of this uh, representation variety so that this is, uh, this is uh, uh, restored. So uh, basically how, so construct some kind of uh, what we call a refined representation variety and a map uh, hull at from the space of spherical metrics to the space of, uh, of representation so that this is uh, um, local differ at every H with non-abelian monodromy. So the, the resolution is basically uh, very easy. You just record at the, at the, at the loop, which is, a, which is the boundary loop. You record the axis of rotation, even if the rotation is uh, of angle 2 pi or 4 pi. So basically, 
if you want to construct this, uh, this uh, rep, you first want to see what are the kind of refined homomorphisms. So if you, let's see, what, are, what is a homomorphism from P1 of S to some group? This is really an n -nuple of elements, A1, B1, AG, BG, C1, CN in SO3, such that they satisfy the relation we know, which is the product of AI, BI, times C1, CN, equal to the identity. Now, if you want to define the, the refinement of this, you take a one BG, and then let me put capital C1, CN, and this is in uh, the group, so SO3 times uh, the the Lie algebra, and uh, you want that A1, sorry, the product of the commutators times the exponentials of C1, exponential of Cn, is equal to the identity, and that the norm of Cj is exactly, uh, well, in this case, uh, well, this. Okay. so basically, uh, G is clearly the group SO3 and G is the Lie algebra. So you see that in this case, taking the exponential of this capital C, you get the element of the group, but when, it's, uh, when you have an angle which is, uh, well, these are different from zero, clearly. When you have an angle which is two pi or four pi and so on, uh, here this element is non-zero, whereas uh, here this is zero. So then you take, quotient by SO3, and then you get the, the resolution you want. So, so why I said this, just say just one word. Um, how do you get the uh, enumeration of uh, the, the fact that the matrix are uh, of a fi the degree is of fixed in a, in a certain chamber? So we have a map from S, SP, so all the matrix with all thetas, possible thetas, to Teichmuller space times A, that space of angles. Now, uh, if you have a matrix with a billion monodromy, so coaxial monodromy, this means that the sum of, so H, a billion, implies that you are all, uh, all monodromies are in the same subgroup, so this means that uh, sum, or, so that there exists a subset of 1n, such that if you sum delta j, where j is this subset, and you subtract the ones not in this subset, then you get something even. So this is uh, exactly the condition that the geodesic, the broken geodesic, that really now stays on the maximal circle of SU2, closes up. Because they are exactly, why you have plus and minuses? Because if you go forward with some side, then you get plus delta J. If you come back, stay on the same circle, then you get minus delta I. So these are exactly this determine some walls inside this space. So if you restrict this map to the walls, to, to something to the projection away from the walls, the proposition is that this map is proper. G is proper and 
not subversive, sorry. Proper. Proper and uh, the two spaces are smooth of the same dimension. So we know that this is, uh, that this, if you fix the angle, this has the same dimension as this. So basically we know that this, if smooth, this has the same dimension as this. And then the theorem I said before, I said that if, so improving Luo, we have got rid of this condition. We have just proven, taking this resolution, that if the representation is not abelian, then this space is smooth. So basically, this space, because we have removed the walls when it can be abelian, this is smooth. And so the only thing that we have to prove is that this map is proper. And really that there is an orientation here, canonical orientation. So this is, uh, you can use some symplectic structure to orient this. To see that this is, uh, and then I stop, to see that this is uh, um, proper, you have to show that if you have a sequence of metrics that are diverging here, and the conf then the, the sequence here diverges too. Now, if it diverges here and uh, it converges on T, you have to show that it diverges in the space of angles. So why this happens? So I'll uh, show you just a picture. Okay, so the, the picture is this. So suppose that you have a sequence of metrics which are diverging. So if the metrics are diverging, this means that because the diameter is bounded, the curvature is blocked, that some conical points are crashing together. So this means that there are some conical points which are getting closer and closer. Now, because we are assuming, so there is this cluster inside this, uh, this box which is getting smaller and smaller. Now, because we are assuming that, to prove this, that here this, the conformal structure is converging and we want to show that we hit a wall, on these big things, uh, there is not much that can happen. Because if you have some topology, some genus, or you have more than one point and you are crashing here, then really you have a cylinder that separates this from this. And then the conformal structure becomes the conformal structure of a nodal curve. So this means that on these big things, you can have at most one point and no topology. So basically here you can have just a sphere with some integral conical point, or here you can have this kind of beams. Now, if you look when this situation degenerates, you look at what's happening here in this box, then you can magnify a lot and you get something that is becoming flat. This is becoming flat and with uh, here you see something that's some kind of funnel that opens up. And if you do the computation here for the, using Gauss Bonnet on this flat surface, what you get is exactly some relation like this, where these positive delta j's are the points which stay in, and the negative ones are the points which are away. So basically you are hitting, you are going to hit a wall. So this proves it's, uh, it's proper. Thank you, sorry for running over time.